Hey guys, and welcome to episode 107 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now in this episode, I got on Dr. Kevin Chapman. I first became aware of Kevin uh, through the guys at NoOCD. So Kevin is on the advisory board for the NoOCD app. Uh, so um, if you go to the show notes or the podcast page on the site uh, you'll find links to the no ocd uh, app if you haven't got it it's a great app and i recommend you download it and try it it's only on ios at the minute uh, that's apple uh, but it should be out on android hopefully this year and uh, it was a pleasure to interview kevin kevin is a licensed psychologist in kentucky uh, he specializes in the treatment of anxiety disorders obviously using cbt and erp for ocd Kevin also is the sports psychologist for Louisville City Football Club, uh, that's soccer. And I wanted to get him on just because uh, I think he's an interesting guy. And uh, from what I heard, he knew a lot about treatment. And uh, from interviewing him, that was definitely the case. Uh, I learned so much chatting with Kevin for the time we had together. Some of the things we talk about is kind of why it takes roughly sort of 17 sessions of ERP for most people to get to get better and why it's longer for some people. Uh, we talk about the key characteristics he's noticed in his clients that recover the quickest. Um, we talk about how his views changed of treating OCD uh, over the last 10 years. And uh, then we answer sort of five listener questions, or more importantly, Kevin does, um, sort of dealing with mental compulsions uh, while doing ERP, um, exposures for sort of panic attacks and hypochondria uh, type of sessions, how to deal with feelings of hopelessness, how to stay motivated, um, and also, you know, ways of dealing with mental discomfort. And uh, and then we get on to some more of the sports psychology stuff. So I'm always interested, as you guys know, um, about all the different areas and how they can be bolted on to the current evidence we have for treating OCD, which is largely ERP. Uh, and I obviously believe that is the main way, but there's always ways we can look to strengthen uh, and encourage the results we get from exposure exposure work. So uh, I asked him various questions around his time at Louisville FC um, and just what he's learned from working with athletes and, and, and what could be applied to the OCD world. Uh, and then the, obviously the usual questions uh, I asked Kevin. But yeah, I really enjoyed this one. I think you guys will too. Uh, here he is. On today's show, I have Dr. Kevin Chapman. Kevin is a licensed psychologist in Kentucky. He specializes in the treatment of anxiety disorders using CBT and ERP for OCD. Kevin is on the board of the No OCD app and is the sports psychologist for Louisville City Football Club. And for my American listeners, that's uh, soccer, the proper football, not American football. And uh, yeah, welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Good, good. Uh, good to have you on. Um, how I always start these shows is usually if someone has OCD, I'll ask kind of their OCD story. But from a clinician's point of view, it'd just be good to understand, you know, why you got into treating anxiety disorders. Well, Stu, I think the main reason I got into uh, treating anxiety disorders is because when I started training uh, as an undergraduate, I knew I wanted to be a clinical psychologist, hence why I majored in psychology. And as I started studying various conditions in the DSM and, you know, the mental disorder manual, um, I noticed something pretty interesting, which was that more people had anxiety disorders than anything else, yet only a third of those people received treatment, even yet treatment is very possible and doable yeah. if you do it the right way with CBT. So naturally I was intrigued um, being a former athlete and also someone who was an egghead in college as well. I said, well, this is an area that I think that would be terrific where there's a need, but also to decrease the stigma associated with anxiety and related disorders with a pro proven treatment method that would be effective. So anxiety disorders, I naturally gravitated to do research in that area, to publish in that area, to find a mentor in that area. And uh, here we are. Yeah, awesome. Um, I, I always wondered, like, it'd be good to see a study of uh, clinicians that go into treating anxiety disorders. For example, I, I'm now training in, in sort of, well, everything at the minute, but eventually specializing into anxiety. Um, and I think I like anxiety, A, because it's something I've experienced myself, but also uh, I like kind of, not quick wins, but I like achieving things. Uh, mm -hmm. And I feel with some of the uh, different disorders and diagnoses, it's it's a much more long term fix where you can get quicker results of anxiety, and I, I like Absolutely. that. Yeah, 
Um, okay, so on your website, I noticed you said it, on average it takes sort of 17 sessions of ERP to see significant improvements. Um, I guess uh, that, I guess um, kind of that's quite a specific number. Uh, so I guess why why that number and also what would be the reasons why it would take someone more than 17 sessions to see that improvement? Is there anything that stands well, out? Yeah, that's a good point. And I know historically in the literature, it, we tend to, like you said, stick with that 17 session number. But honestly, you know, there's some more innovative work in the literature these days with ERP um, that goes into this notion of inhibitory learning, which is another concept that goes into the exposure process that actually indicates that, you know, people see immense symptom improvement much sooner than 17 sessions these days, which is very encouraging, I think. Yeah. With that said, people who go beyond the 17 sessions, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, right? On one hand, ambivalence is a normal part of treating anxiety and OCD because it waxes and wanes. It does get extremely uncomfortable to confront fear and confront anxiety. And you're asking someone, right, to confront things that they've been avoiding and have, it, mm. have developed a number of rituals to feel better, which provides temporary relief. But ultimately, we're asking them to reprogram the way they think about these situations. So many people, it's just the normal ambivalence of the treatment process. Um, other people, it can get costly, right? It can get pretty expensive yeah. um, and time consuming. So because of that, you know, some people have to space out, decrease the frequency of sessions and things like that. But also, through, I think mainly there's a lot of comorbidities, too. You know, you have people who have symptoms of OCD, but they also have other problems, of course, like depression, which yeah. is highly comorbid with OCD. Some of them have panic disorder. Some have social anxiety disorder. So when you're treating these various comorbidities, it also can complicate the clinical picture as well. Yes, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, OK, so what, you know, in your years of experience, what have you noticed about the the clients that just recover much quicker than others. Um, obviously, it depends on kind of, as you say, comorbidities and stuff, but kind of taking that away, is there anything you notice about those that just really get a lot out of ERP? That's a great question. And I think that the, the common factors that I've noticed over the years with the clients that have been very successful in a shorter amount of time, really the main factor is that they're extremely motivated and that they're within with the symptoms. So these are people who you know, unless they're an adolescent, which I see them as well. But for adults, they've struggled with OCD symptoms for years, sometimes a decade or, or more. And they literally hit their relative bottom. So they're saying, you know, I can't take these symptoms anymore. I have to do something about it. I've tried meds. I've tried counseling. I've tried other mental health therapies and modalities, and none of them have been very effective. So ultimately, the people who are saying, I don't care what I have to do. I've, w I've read up on ERP. I've looked online. I've heard that it's the most effective. I don't care what I have to do. I will trust you in this process mm. and will trust that you know how to lead me to freedom. And as you know, there is most certainly freedom. The people who are really motivated to do that, who actually complete homework assignments, so who are adherent to the treatment approach, because you know you spend 1% of your waking hours with me, Stu, if you see me once a week, right? Mm. ERP often twice a week. But if you see me once a week, I see you 1% of your waking hours meaning 99% of you is outside of my office or the home visit or whatever it may be. So you have to adhere to the treatment plan and do homework ultimately, because that's where most of your distress is going to be derived anyway. Yeah. So the motivation, adherence to the process, meaning you have to build very strong rapport. They have to trust you, right? I'm not going to get a client to do something I wouldn't do. So being motivated and being very adherent to the homework are the two factors that I've seen across the board easily with people who do very well. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. And I think you mentioned there about trust, trusting the process, the treatment, and you as a therapist. Um, right. I have often talked about it on this podcast as kind of having faith that it's going to work, That, but you've got to put that trust in. Uh, and sometimes, right. you know, as you said before, facing your fears is scary. Uh, and it takes a it certain amount of faith and trust to to take that leap. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess this is more of a selfish question for myself as a trainee. Um, is there any ways in particular of getting people to adhere to their homework other than that they're just really motivated because there's some that aren't going to be? How would you deal with that? Well, I think through my, my experience, I think that there's, Something, the intangibles, right? I know you said you'd mentioned something about asking a, about some sports-like stuff at some point, but we yeah. talk often about intangibles. 
And I think one of the intangibles as a trainee to understand is that the stronger your rapport, the more alliant the client is likely going to be with your approach and your procedures. So I think if you're able to build strong rapport in the therapeutic alliance with the client, mm. I think they're going to trust anything you say. Yeah. And I say that in a very encouraging way, not in a manipulative one. Yeah. I mean that they're going to say that, hey, Stu's a great guy. Like He seems to be sharing his heart with me. I trust his process. He has the credentials that I need. He's the expert, and he's funny, and he's a nice guy. Well, ultimately, I think he's the right fit, and I'm going to listen to him because he's a pro. So ultimately, if you can build really strong rapport and not just be a taskmaster, that's one thing. I think the second thing is to be very collaborative. Like many clients may come to you, right, and think, well, you tell me what to do. Well, ultimately, you know, CBT is very collaborative when done correctly. So we need your buy-in and your say-so. This is a creative endeavor that requires both of us to be adherent to the treatment process. And you're an expert on yourself. I'm an expert in what I know, but to help you, you need to help me help you. So ultimately, I think that if you can understand that this is a therapeutic alliance that is built upon collaboration, if we do that, I think many clients will increase their adherence substantially. Cool. Yeah, really good advice. Thank you. Um, So maybe... So basically, my next question is kind of, has your view of treating people with OCD uh, changed in the last 10 years? And if so, uh, how or why? That's a great question. That's a, I'm glad you asked me that question because, you know, as a psychologist, we have continuing education and we still publish and write for a reason. We're always learning, right? So that's a terrific question. I think what I'd say is that we know ERP is the gold standard for OCD treatment, hands down. And... That is, that is a beautiful thing. What we've learned over the years, though, are there's ways to enhance ERP through borrowing from other parts of the scientific literature, but also understanding other models of habituation and exposure, mm-hmm. right? So I think in the last 10 years, one thing that, this is a bold statement, too, but hey, it's, it's a great one. But ultimately, I think one thing that I've learned and appreciated is that I don't get bogged down as much on studs rating, yeah. subjective unit of distress scale, right? So zero to 100 is typically, I think, you know, what we use, but I don't get so bogged down on that distress decreasing in during exposure. I think that there's a lot of literature out there that actually dissuades us from that because that can become a safety signal oftentimes for clients who are struggling with OCD to say, well, if I don't, if my distress doesn't decrease, then this must not be working or it's not working correctly. And that's simply not true. That's not predictive of outcome whatsoever. So I think one piece, is not relying so much on numbers and subjective report. I think something else I've learned over the last decade through working with OCD is that you don't necessarily have to go in order on the hierarchy. And I think that that's really important because there's new literature that talks about this idea of starting low on one hierarchy, but also jumping around where you can because it actually helps you with long-term learning retention when you do that, when there's some variability on the hierarchy. So not getting so bogged down with the number per se or with the distress going down per se or having to go in an exact order, I think being flexible but adhering to the fidelity of ERP is essential to treatment outcome. But I think relaxing and loosening up on how we have generally approached it over the last 10 years, that's something that I've learned that's been amazingly effective for most of the clients I've worked with. Yeah. Yeah, so become a bit more flexible with the hierarchy. And um, so if, you, if you're not uh, so concerned with SUDs anymore, um, what, how are you kind of measuring, or how is the client measuring success? Is it the fact that they did the exposure and that's all that matters? Or is there something that's else great, you're looking for? That's a great question. And I definitely want to be clear that I, I still rate SUDs. Yeah. I, I'm a fan of SUDs. But I will say this, though, Stu, so like in the most recent literature, you know, this notion of exposure, a viola- expectancy violation, as we call it. In other words, what are you afraid is going to happen when you're exposing to the situation and getting clients to begin to rate what their expectation is if they had to interact with a certain trigger of some sort? And then if they're violating that expectation, so setting up the exposure so that it's maximally violating the expectancy that I'm going to like lose control of my bladder if mm-hmm. I'm in a situation with a knife or I'm going to take the knife, probably start shaking and go toward my loved one. Like if that's the concrete example, putting them in that situation long enough where that expectation is violated 
and they're able to say new learning occurred is just as powerful. So the SUDS does change, obviously, right? So yeah. habituation is a part of that process, to be clear. But I think that when a client can subjectively tell you that their percentage and belief of the expectation changes, that's a very powerful indicator of how well they're doing with that exposure as well. Yeah, that's, I like that. Um, I mean, I'm sure the p- purist behaviorists might not like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, they they read the same literature. I'm sure they'll say, yeah, that's a good point, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, okay, so uh, we got sort of five listener questions now. Um, so okay. the first one is, and some, some of these we might have to kind of work together on in terms of understanding them because I don't often get the context, um, so we might have to assume. But the first one is, uh, how do you deal with mental compulsions while doing ERP? Uh, and I guess... Yeah the way I read this was as more kind of, you know, reviewing facts in your head, uh, going over memories, maybe, um, how, I guess, how do you stop that? Is it a matter of just catching it? And then that's a great question. So I think one, one remedy for the mental rituals, as you said, one part to do is what you said, it's catching it. But I think once you catch it, I think one antidote to that is doing a mental or imaginal exposure to that mental ritual. Because oftentimes when we have a mental ritual, mm-hmm. we just let it run its course, which of course, as you know, provides us with temporary relief. Yep. We wipe our brow, but then we get triggered again, and then we have to do that mental ritual again. So ultimately, what I like to tell clients is to play out that distress that they're having when they get triggered by engaging in a mental ritual to the worst case scenario. So for mm-hmm. example, you know, I've had plenty of clients who've had these situations where they look back and they think, well, was I really standing too close to that person? Did I se- sexually assault that person? And they're trying to play out in their head if they were too close or not, or if they fell asleep on the airplane, like did I have my hand move toward that person sitting next to me? Well, the way to play that ritual out is to go engage in imaginal exposure and say, yeah, my hand probably was too close to them. Yeah. Can I tolerate the uncertainty that I did touch that person in their criteria, can I tolerate the uncertainty that they're probably going to find me and revoke my flying? Okay, so playing out that scenario until that expectation is violated, and of course, that SUDS rating goes down. Nice, yeah, and of course, do you recommend then kind of just doing as you said, talking it out, or is it you when would I guess when would you go from that to writing it down or maybe recording it and listening to it every day? Well, I think that you know, to your point, I think it. it, it it depends on the client, right? I think that that would be a very powerful strategy depending on how distressing that mental ritual is for that particular client. But I think that that's a perfect strategy as well as writing it down and recording it as well. And Stu, you brought up another point. I think what we call linguistic processing, which we borrow from neuroscience, Mm -hmm. is very effective for exposure by actually saying out loud how I feel about the uncertainty that I don't know. If I violated this person's privacy that's sitting next to me, so verbalizing that's a powerful strategy as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, The next listener question is, um, how do you suggest working with exposures when obsessions relate to somatic experiences like panic attacks and hypochondria? That's a great question. So ultimately, we, we know that part of the way to maximize exposure across the anxiety disorder spectrum is to induce the same sensations that are distressing to me. So ultimately, there's a lot of terminology for that. There's some stuff, there's there's a term in the literature called occasional reinforced extinction, where you actually trigger the distress that I've been avoiding. If I'm a panic person and I've started confronting it via CBT and my panic attacks have essentially gone away, Mm. then occasionally inducing panic symptoms is actually good for long-term learning retention, which prevents relapse. So what am I saying? I'm saying including what we call interoceptive exposures, like whether it be ingesting too much caffeine, some espresso shots, like there's a lot of different ways to stimulate those sensations that panickers, of course, are afraid of. So doing that in the midst of exposure actually maximizes the learning retention for people with OCD as well. So engaging in the bodily sensation exercises in addition to using exposure statements in the midst of ERP is a very effective way to habituate to that. Yeah, no, I like that. I've never heard of that before. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. We case... do that a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got an espresso machine in your office. Oh, yeah. yeah. I do, actually, oh, really? for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, that must be costly. Um, <laughs> okay, so the next listener question is, uh, and 
I'd guess this somewhat maybe depression's alongside this, but uh, which is how do you cope with the feelings of hopelessness? Okay. In the midst of OCD or just in general, what it you was, think? That was literally the question, but um, they follow my page, which is all about OCD, so I assume it's in relation to OCD. Okay. Well, my kind of our cardinal rule here, Stu, as you are well aware, is that anytime someone's struggling with feelings of hopelessness, chances are those can be pretty predictive of also having the depression symptomology along with mm-hmm. it. So you know, well, as well as I do, that with OCD, one of the highest comorbidities is depression. So hopelessness is a construct related to that. And in that regard, I think that we our cardinal rule typically is we have to treat the depression symptoms first because naturally, if I'm anxious, it tends to be the negative affectivity, which makes me feel worse about my circumstances and probably increases the likelihood that I'm not going to be adherent to the OCD treatment because I feel hopeless. So it's a it's kind of bi-directional relationship. So in many ways, I think that through behavioral activation, being able to engage in pleasurable activities is usually going to be the, one of the number one goals and treatment recommendations is to decrease the, the feelings of hopelessness so that one can adhere to the OCD principles and ERP. So ultimately what I told people who have feelings of hopelessness is we target that directly first so that we can get them to start confronting feelings of sadness, engaging in pleasurable activities, even violating the expectancy that we talked about earlier, Stu, where, you know, what's the evidence that you're going to not enjoy this situation or calling this friend or having tea with this friend? Well, ultimately triggering or or targeting that hopelessness is the number one area that I'd go for first. Mm -hmm. And then that gives them more confidence to start violating expectancies with the OCD work. Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, okay, so the next one is kind of similar to that, which is uh, how does one stay motivated in what seems like an endless day-to-day struggle? Uh, and I guess this this sounds like it is less depression-focused and probably more more with just the tirelessness of anxiety. Yeah, and, and that's a really good question as well. And I think that, and Sue, that's a really good reason why I think being flexible in the um, application of ERP is going to be important for a person like that because mm-hmm. we often get bogged down by the process of ERP. Yep. The process of ERP is very difficult, right? It's very uncomfortable. And I'm going to experience a lot of negative affect and distress in relation to the ERP. So I think that one way to kind of curb that is this idea that rather than getting bogged down with, well, you have to do exposure this many times a day for this long, which creates a lot of distress in people and it makes them their ambivalence kind of wax and wane. I think approaching it more flexibly as the client um, and, and giving myself more grace, so to speak, by saying, well, if I do exposure today, let's try to violate the expectation that I'm not going to be able to enjoy say that watching this movie Mm -hmm. or that I'm not going to be able to enjoy watching the sporting event rather than, well, I have to do it for two hours. And if I don't do it for two hours and my stress doesn't go down, then it's a failure. I think that that's where ERP can be too rigidly applied and many people will start, you know, losing motivation to engage in that process. So I think being flexible in approaching ERP Mm -hmm. by not getting so bogged down on the rigidity of it sometimes, and being flexible in how I approach that would actually help with that part of the day-to-day struggle and give you more confidence to be able to approach the next thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, so next question is, um, they, they haven't put it in relation to ERP, but I think it kind of fits with with kind of when you're doing the exposure. So it's, is, is the only way to deal with mental discomfort to, sem- to simply sit with it and let it pass? So I guess that's a bit between doing the exposure and, yeah, riding it out. So the only way to deal with mental discomfort to sit with it? Is that what yeah, and let it pass. Is there any other kind of ways to approach it? Uh, not necessarily. I think that there's definitely other ways to approach it. I guess when I hear that question, Stu, I'm thinking that that's more of an acceptance okay. and commitment type approach, which I agree with. I think that ACT does add a powerful infusion into ERP principles for sure. So more of a mindfulness, let it be. In fact, the the no CD app is really big on that acceptance yeah. and commitment approach. But I think that again, other ways to deal with that though, is to violate that expectancy by saying, writing out ahead of time, all right, this is how distressed I think I'm going to be. And I think that this is how uncomfortable I will be in this situation. 
write a percentage down of how uncomfortable I think I'll be and then test it out and see. So there's no cognitive work there at all. No cognitive change happens, right? So ultimately it's confronting that situation in a much more flexible way by coming up with a mini experiment and confronting it as opposed to just sitting with the distress. So can I tolerate that this viol- this expectation will be violated is another way to deal with that. So I do think that, you know, sitting with it and letting it pass is certainly the natural course of an emotion, but that's not always going to be effective for many people just because other people are going to need to confront that much more aggressively. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, okay. Thanks for the, for answering the listener questions. Um, I have a few questions now around sports psychology um, mm-hmm. because I often try and tie in when, whenever my guests have an area of expertise that's, made, that's slightly outside of OCD. I, I often think, you know, we, we have all these diagnoses. We put these nice little boxes around things, but in reality, the brain doesn't have boxes. It's all kind of intermingled. Um, so Absolutely. I think there's a lot of learnings from different areas. So uh, I know it's on your website that you, you, in the past, you worked at the University of Louisville. Um, And it said there that you used to teach, I guess, to the athletes, mental toughness, enhancing self-talk, mental imagery. Um, I guess the question is, is there any use to that for the general population or or OCD population in recovery? Absolutely. You you, you said that very in a very articulate way, honestly, Stu. I think that, like you said, I'm not a big label person either for the very reason that you said. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, all of these processes are endemic to just about anything that we do, whether it be performing in an orchestra or being an athlete or being someone who struggles with symptoms of OCD or panic attacks or social anxiety. Ultimately, there's a common thread between the CBT principles that we talk about and all of the things you said. Mm. So mental imagery is powerful. You know, the fact that mental rituals are a thing speaks to the power of mental imagery. So we know that uh, new neural pathways are created in your brain when you perf- when you imagine yourself performing certain bodily bodily movements. So that in and of itself has an impact not only on OCD recovery but also in other areas, right? Whether it be giving a speech in the case of social anxiety, being able to sit in the middle row of a theater and not get, sit on the aisle seat in the case of panic and agoraphobia, right? Being able to see myself crossing the bridge in the case of a fear of heights. Like all of those things share a common thread and mental skills are important in any area that you're in, whether it be sports, OCD recovery, whether you're an accountant, regardless of what you do, mental skills can be developed and we all have them. It's just a matter of enhancing those through what people call, of course, like self-talk. Self-talk is just using different appraisals, right, to confront strong emotions. That's what self-talk really is. Mental imagery, the same process is having a positive imagination of what you want to see doing as opposed to what you don't want to see. So all of those have a common thread across those conditions. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, um, well, at least from my experience and, you know, I think I, I don't know how many people I've interviewed now, but quite a lot. And it's, it's never really come up this idea of mental imagery and, um, obviously in sports, it's perfectly accepted. You know, if, if an athlete tells you that they vision themselves holding the NBA championship and scoring that <laughs> buzzer beater or whatever, you don't think anything of it, but, um, right. it's not something that gets talked about in OCD. And I feel it in the past, well, a lot of my kind of goals and stuff, I, not so much recently I've been bad, but I used to definitely kind of visualize it. Uh, yeah. and I've found I've always been more successful when I've done that because I've had that kind of pathway. Um, and it's kept me going when I've hit resistance, which you naturally will in ERP. And I think that's a great point, too, that something I'd add to that is, you know, one of the common threads that people forget is that with the OCD treatment process and recovery with athletics and all the things we've been discussing, Mm. I think the common thread there to keep in mind for the listeners, too, is that those who are successful actually are following the process of getting better, not the outcome, per se. And that's also true in sports. The most successful athletes and the most successful people in OCD recovery are those who are trusting the process of recovery as opposed to just the outcome of recovery. Mm. The outcome is obviously what we all want, but if I'm following that process, that leads to the outcome. Yeah. Just like if I have a, if I want an NBA championship, well, that's terrific as an outcome goal, but are you working on your mechanics? Yeah. Are you working on your mental imagery? Are you working on your free throw shooting? Are you working on getting quicker, stronger, faster? Those things lead 
to that outcome, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, I don't know. I, I never actually saw this study, but I've heard it quoted a few times where they did a study with, or apparently with, um, I don't know what level of basketball players they were, but the ones that, however long period, the ones that uh, just practice shooting versus those that just practice mental imagery and those that practice both, like the ones that didn't do any mental imagery were worse than those that just did mental imagery. Is that true? Correct. That is very true, and yeah. I, I laugh and smirk and snicker, <laughs> you know, technically maniacal laugh yeah. because I tell athletes that all the time, too. Literally, if you want a quick and dirty, easy way to improve free throw shooting or any body movement of any sort is to literally lock yourself in a room, mentally imagine yourself engaging in the free throw shooting, for example. Yeah. Have a ball in your hand, close your eyes, distraction-free, 20 to 30 minutes a day new neural pathways in your brain are firing like crazy so that when you're actually at the free throw line, it only takes a brief part of that image for your body to do the right shooting. Mm. It's amazing how mm. the human body works in that way. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad I didn't make that up. <laughs> no, um, you, you most certainly didn't make that up. <laughs> <laughs> you hear all these people quote studies and sometimes obviously I can't check every study. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what... Um, out of fascination, kind of what what work do you do for the Louisville FC? What yeah, does it involve so being City a sports FC. psychologist? Yeah, it's funny. I, I got a couple text messages, like probably in the middle of the call, I saw it pop across my screen. It's uh, preseason for those guys, and yep. they want to get in and talk about some process related stuff. So basically, what I do with Little City is really I'm their mental skills coach, right? I'm their psychologist, so guys can see me individually and or as a group. So we do mental skill development, mm. such as we create process goals, like how are you going to enhance your techniques and mechanics? How are, what mental skills are you going to use? We come up with coming up with very powerful appraisals. One thing I really like to do is what I call a self-directed cue. I work a lot with guys where we, I have what I call an emoji board where we create powerful cues like a, an, an image of some sort, like an emoji that they put on their body so that when they see it, it triggers them to do the right thing in the right moment while they're on the pitch playing soccer. So ultimately, we work on all things mental skills depending on the individual need of the guys, but as collectively as a team, we talk about things like leadership, how to hold each other accountable, how to follow one's process. Honestly, CBT is what we do. <laughs> yeah. As I said, that um, emoji board thing sounds a lot like NLP. Yeah. Like anchoring. Right. Is that right? Right. It's, yeah, it's a lot like anchoring. Exactly. I would. I don't know if it's going to be distracting. I could show you an example. I have one right here, but it's really big. But but ultimately, yeah, I have a board that has different symbols on it from the last season, which, by the way, they won the national, they won the championship this past nice. season, which is awesome. Um, so that's exciting. So they're gearing up for preseason now, and uh, they're coming in and checking in with me about various goals. But anyway, we use the board, and they see each image on the board, like you said, like anchoring. I like anchoring. And it's like, oh, yeah, that. So it takes on a significant meaning to that individual player of I need to be working on my dribbling, or I need to be more aggressive in what I'm yelling to my teammate, or I need to – so it's all process. It's not looking at how many goals they have. It's not looking at how many uh, – what, what happens at the end of the match. It's while I'm on the pitch, I'm only focusing on my individual process. And that's what leads to outcome. Yeah, I like that. Is it, is it John Wooden, the NCAA basketball coach, who uh, every day his only goal wasn't to win championships, was just to make every single player slightly better? Exactly, yeah. yep, and that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so I guess my last question on kind of the sports side of things is, um, has working with athletes taught you anything that can be applied to the OCD population or anxiety population? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that what, what I found, too, is this idea of having what we call grit. And there was a book that recently came out yeah. called From Grit to Great. And I think one of the things that working with athletes that has taught me that's tremendously important for OCD recovery is if you think about that acronym GRIT, you know, certainly having guts. So you got to, like, be strong. You have to trust the process and stay with it. You have to be resilient, which is super important. Yeah. for OCD recovery, knowing that you're going to be triggered and have a lot of distress, but knowing what I call the emotional law of gravity, what goes up must come down. So having resilience, having initiative, so taking initiative, 
adhering to your homework and the things that are prescribed to you in that ERP process. And then, of course, the T is tenacity, like staying strong despite how you're feeling that day, knowing that there's always going to be light at the end of the tunnel because you can't recover from the symptoms of OCD. So having grit and athletes, the successful ones have grit and the people who have strong recovery within OCD have grit and they share that common bond for sure. It's just staying like we say in football, American football, and that's the pitch in American football. <laughs> A good quarterback learns to stay in the pocket. You might get hit in the ribs, but I completed a touchdown. And that's ultimately the same process with OCD recovery. It does feel painful at times, but there is absolutely light at the end of the tunnel. Nice, yeah. I think we got the title of the episode there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so I've got sort of four sort of funner type questions or free funner type questions now so um what advice do you have for those well for everyone listening to kind of live a good life their best life whatever kind of word we want to use or a okay. meaningful well, life yeah i'd say well always make sure that you have good self-care and spend as much time with those that you love that you possibly can i think at the end of the day like we're not going to remember all the things that we have all the things we all the valuables and all the tangible things. I think that when we're with our loved ones, research supports the idea that the positive expression of emotion is most pronounced when we're with people that we care about, when we're laughing, when we're joking, when we're hanging out with our friends. And I think spending time with the people that you love as much as you possibly can is not only key to recovery, but also to living a, fulf a fulfilled life in that way. And I think spending time in the present moment, enjoying the company of those who support you and who love you, I think is extremely important and that's true in my life as well. And I make sure that I don't take that for granted. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. So you're, you're in an elevator, uh, going up a few, few stories. Um, someone gets in, they've, they've heard you on this podcast. They know who you are. They ask you some advice. Uh, what'd you tell them in that 30 seconds? What would I tell them in that 30 seconds? I, I'd tell them the emotional law of gravity. What goes up? must come down ride the wave there is light at the end of the tunnel and this too shall pass nice yeah love that quote. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh so you've got a, a billboard somewhere in in the states um what do you want written on that billboard for the world to see i'd say uh oh that's a good one wow I mean, let me process that one i would say confront fear you win in the end one thing if i had to make it up would be invest anxiety for a calmer future in other words this distress that we all experience is temporary it gets better yeah yeah i love that um is there anything i haven't asked you that you wish you could share um i think you've asked me good questions in fact Stu, the fact that you asked me about sports bike was kind of fun i had no idea you would and i'm glad that you did because many times it's kind of this mystical concept, right? And we don't really know what people who are in sports like do. But as you know, I'm a clinical psychologist who has a sports background. So I'm glad you asked me things in that area. But I'd say that um, ultimately the main thing that I'd add is something you actually mentioned earlier. And that is the label is not as important, right, as the symptom cluster. And I'm really big on that because ultimately, you know, we're treating – an underlying syndrome of emotional dysregulation when we're dealing with OCD recovery, when, we deal, when we're dealing with panic, when we're dealing with social anxiety, when we're dealing with those things. That's why those treatment ingredients cut across all of those emotional disorder symptoms. And I think that if we become what we call in our literature, flexible with fidelity, people improve. Mm. Yeah. So that last bit, um, flexible with, did you say fidelity? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, if you could you break that down a bit more, that'd be good. Yeah, absolutely. So ERP is effective. Yeah. CBT is effective. There's plenty of people, maybe it's a different podcast too, but there's plenty of people who do CBT, right? Yes. Which they really don't because they're not, they're not well versed in the research literature and they don't do it in a, in a, in a really research-based scientific way. It's more so using techniques here and there. Yeah. And I think that the fidelity of CBT and ERP is applying it in a really structured, collaborative, time-sensitive way. So that's the fidelity piece, not straying mm -hmm. from the ingredients of treatment that are effective. The flexibility piece, though, are recognizing that you don't know everything. 
you're always learning and your client knows, knows, knows more about them and their own symptoms than you do. So ultimately, the flexibility piece is being creative when developing exposures, thinking outside of the box, consulting with colleagues when you need to. Please leave the office when you have certain exposures you have to do. 99% of my exposures do not happen in my office. <laughs> they happen in cars. They happen in trunks of cars. They happen, you know, in bathrooms. They happen at home. So what I'm saying is that though most of us are trained to stick to our guns, so to speak, and to apply in a very rigid fashion the treatment ingredients and the treatment components of ERP and CBT, it's important to remain flexible in applying those ingredients. And that's when people get better. That's when rapport is its strongest. And that's when you learn more. Yeah, no, I thank you for that. I, I like it. Is there a uh, kind of a governing body for CBT in the United States? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that the the primary governing body that that most people would agree with would be the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, mm. abct.org. So abct.org, uh, that's been an organization that I've been involved with for since I was a graduate student. <laughs> And they've had a tremendous impact on my professional life. And honestly, Stu, anybody that you see, the the names in the field, if you will, they are absolutely members of either ABCT and or the International OCD Foundation, which I'm also a member of as well, and the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Those three organizations are very powerful um, in CBT contingents. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I was only asking for the listeners because I know in the UK there's, obviously, like you said, rightly said, a lot of people say they can do CBT. The CBT yeah, is right. a very specific, uh, specific uh, kind of protocol that you, you follow. Obviously, you can be flexible, but as you okay. said, some people dabble and that's not CBT then. Um, Absolutely right. And we have the, the BABCP here in the UK. Uh, and so anyone listening to the UK, obviously, make sure they're kind of registered with that. Um, otherwise they're not technically a CBT therapist. <laughs> and they collaborate a lot, by the way, because I'm familiar with that organization, okay. as you probably can, can imagine. So they, they obviously collaborate, co- collaborate a lot with ABCT. So you're absolutely right. I definitely agree with you there, too. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, brilliant. Um, I mean, you've done loads of research as well, which we haven't, I didn't ask you any questions on. So, you know, I'm sure I'll get you back on again in the future to kind of go into some That'd of be that. Perfect. I love that. It'd be awesome. Cool. So there you have it, another episode of the OCDstories.com podcast. All the show notes and resources will be at the OCDstories.com uh, forward slash or backslash, not sure which one, podcast. Uh, as always, here's a disclaimer. Uh, this podcast is not therapy, nor should it be a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Have a good week and I wish you all the best. <laughs>